Thank you very much for joining us. So tonight's topic is from medieval commons to the organization of modern business. And uh, I'd like to start off by just getting you to think about the way many people view the organization of business today. It's, it's usually through two lenses. The first is the idea of a corporate hierarchy. And the second is the idea of markets. And, and they're sort of two polar ends of the extreme, but they are the way that most people think about business and, the, and even governments these days seem to have become enamored with markets. Although uh, having been trained as an economist, I know that we spend most of our time worrying about where markets fail. So we're, we're probably more skeptical of them than some of the people who, who are now uh, seeing them as the solution to lots of things. But we, we have generally these two points of view. And what I'd like to uh, go back to today is that the idea that there have long been other ways of organizing economic activity. And one is what I put in the title, the idea of medieval commons. And the medieval commons had interesting structures. Uh, they were rules and conventions and ways that people were supposed to interact. And, and those commons were, rules were designed to help people with different skills cooperate to produce things, but also to encourage cooperation to keep the, the common healthy from an environmental point of view, not to overexploit it, um, to, to have the different activities that were uh, taking place there be complementary and um, bring together different skills and knowledge of different people. We also uh, had an, another sort of structure that was talked a lot about in the 19th century uh, by Alfred Marshall, who discussed the way industrial districts work. So that many towns or districts were specialized in a certain uh, thing like uh, Stoke-on-Trent in, in China and so on. And he, he had an interesting concept that there again, there are a whole lot of conventions and rules and understandings that allowed people with different skills who were in these uh, industrial districts to work together. And, and of course, they attracted people with skills in the area they were working on. And, and kind of made a positive spiral of innovation and knowledge creation. And he talked about something in the air in these industrial districts, which was the kind of knowledge of how these things worked. And the same can be true of the rice terraces in Asia. To make the rice terraces work, you, you have to have a, a very complicated system of the water flow, uh, getting it to work to the right volumes over time. And again, a set of rules and conventions to bring together people with different skills uh, to, to produce things from this environment or this organization, and also to make sure the uh, environment remains healthy. And the final example, which we talk about in the book is the lobster gangs in Maine. Uh, a lot of people used to think of these lobster fishermen in Maine as a sort of typical sea cowboy, but in fact, there are a, a very complicated set of complementarities between people with different skills in the lobster fishing industry, and also a lot of rules about where you could lay your traps and which direction you could lay them in so that you didn't tangle up the, the gear of other people and so on. So, the point is that historically, there are a lot of other ways of organizing economic activity that weren't just about the corporate hierarchy or an impersonal market. And each of those alternative ways of organizing business share some common principles and some common advantages. The first thing is, as I mentioned, they enable participants with different but complementary capabilities to work together for their joint benefit. 
at the same time, they preserve individual incentives and a degree of individual autonomy. And finally, the system maintains flexibility and the ability to evolve organically as circumstances change and as it learns and innovates and, and new people join and uh, so forth. So it, it has those different ways of organizing business had some very particular sorts of advantages. So the question that my co-author and I began to ask is, well, if there were those advantages, why did managers come to neglect these other forms of organization? And the first reason is that from the late 19th century, the quest to reap economies of scale at the level of corporations became very much the driving force of business. I put a picture of the Model T Ford there, which is probably one of the best examples of this drive for standardization of products and processes that could be easily controlled and repeated inside a corporate hierarchy. So we saw, especially within America in the late 19th century, this drive for standardization and scale. And of course, as business activities spread across the globe, it, it also became more difficult to rely on coordination through proximity and mutual adjustment. And, and the, the other methods I talked about, like the medieval commons or the lobster gangs, they're all about coordination through proximity and mutual adjustment rather than a top-down sort of hierarchical way of coordinating things. And the final reason is that the architecture of many products became more modular. And as they became more modular, they allowed complex international supply chains where the interfaces between the uh, various participants were very well defined. So they became sort of plug compatible bits in making a product or in an industry. Uh, and, and that's very different from the industrial districts where people were adjusting and the uh, interfaces were often quite fuzzy and implicit and not, not well defined. So certain things start to happen from the late 19th century that made managers forget these other forms of organization and their potential advantages. And that probably reached a peak in, in a book called The Tra Tragedy of the Commons, which was written by an ecologist, Garrett Hardin in 1968, and published in the Journal of Science was the first article, later it became a book. And one of his key arguments was that if all the members of the group joined, jointly used common resources for their own gain, and with no regard for others, then all the common resources would eventually be depleted. So his argument is that these historic forms of organization that I've mentioned really wouldn't work and, and they would destroy the, uh, the golden goose, the, the common resources that had provided the livelihoods for, for everybody. And this became a very much the accepted wisdom. About 1999, the Nobel Prize winning economist Eleanor Ostrom and her collaborators revisited this argument. In a, and they found that the tragedy of the commons was neither prevalent nor difficult to solve. And that all the cases they looked up, locals, often came up with solutions to the problems themselves without any kind of controlling um, uh, person or, or, or group uh, like you find in a corporate hierarchy. But it was also acknowledged by Eleanor that pure self-organization couldn't always be relied upon, especially when business was international. So we started to rethink at this time, maybe some of these other earlier forms of organizing things might have advantages and the problems that 
meant they were rejected, perhaps were, were not really problems that were insoluble, but you might need more than self-organization to make them work. Now, what I would contend to you is that the problems and opportunities we face now are beyond the capabilities of any single company. And therefore, perhaps we have to look back to some of these other organizational forms from history. And that, I think that was beautifully summed up by Germany's president, Frank Walter Steinmeier, talking about the coronavirus and COVID-19, when he said, no single entity covers the medical, economic, and political elements required to produce a vaccine for all. In other words, this is not a problem that can be solved by one company or one country or one group or one industry. It, it goes beyond all those things and therefore the corporate hierarchy uh, is perhaps not a suitable way to, to solve that kind of problem. And related to that, of course, the management of knowledge, which is the essential driver of corporate innovation in the modern world, is, is not easily contained within well-defined geographical corporate boundaries. So for those two reasons, we start to think about whether or not we should look back to some of these earlier forms of organization of business. And if you think more broadly about the challenges that 21st century business uh, faces, uh, they're different from those that spawn the corporate hierarchy. I, I won't go through this in, in full detail, but just to pick out a couple of things, uh, we've moved away from standardized products to complex customer-driven solutions where values influenced by the broader context and also the relevant capabilities to provide those kind of complex solutions and the knowledge is scattered around the world they're not just inside one company or one location and of course we all know that communication costs have, have been falling and, and it's now possible to connect people up who are not necessarily in the same uh, company. If you look at those kind of problems and opportunities, the traditional ways of organizing didn't seem to hold the answers to them. The traditionally vertically integrated corporate hierarchies or well-defined supply chains, they're not suited to customer-driven solutions requiring complex and uncertain combinations of uh, diverse and dispersed knowledge. And they're, they're very good at doing standardized things, but they're not easily and quickly flexibly reconfigured when things become volatile. At the same time, if we look at the other end of the spectrum and the two views of how you organize business I started off with, Markets composed of many participants acting independently and myopically in their own interests in response to price signals, they lack the necessary coordination to deal with complex combinations of diverse and dispersed messy knowledge. So these markets are very good at dealing with things you can put a price on and that you can easily define. That's why when you trade something like pork bellies, of course, you don't trade the physical pork bellies. What you trade is a standardized contract, which you can put a price on, which is a, a representative pork belly. So markets really fail where you can't easily put a price on things. And of course, the value or the price of messy knowledge is very hard to put a price on. And they're... they're not very good at dealing with things that are not easily boxed up into standardized packages. And again, knowledge is a kind of fluid and complicated thing, and therefore markets often fail. So the traditional ways of organizing didn't really seem to have the answers. 
So we thought about perhaps we needed to think about business more as an ecosystem, more in common with the things I have mentioned, the, the, the different forms of organizing I mentioned before. And in fact, the idea of a business ecosystem was actually coined in 1993 by a chap called Moore. And he said, it's a network of organizations and individuals that co-evolve their capabilities and roles and align their investments so as to create additional value or improve efficiency. So this idea that we perhaps had an ecosystem. And going back to the other forms of organization like the medieval commons, we felt that these ecosystems had a similar sort of advantages. The, the first was that they, they were very good at joint learning and coordinating investment by bringing together partners with diverse capabilities. And they were quite good at accelerating innovation outside the kind of straitjacket of a formal organization or a market where, again, the knowledge or the benefits of innovation had to be priced and which is very difficult. And that they were good at fostering flexibility so that partners could synchronize their adjustments in their activities to the changing circumstances. So we studied a variety of different industries to work out, well, how could a company lead such an ecosystem? And you can see some of these are digital businesses like Alibaba or Amazon Web Services. Uh, some of them are in things like healthcare. The Guardian newspaper was one. That's a system is makes um, computer aided design software. And I'd like to talk about one of our homespun companies in Cambridge uh, that built one of these ecosystems and benefited hugely from it. And ARM, as many of you know, and I should mention that all of you use ARM's products because their chip designs are in 95% of every mobile phone in the world. Uh, was founded in November 1990 as Advanced Risk Machines. It had just 3.2 million US dollars of capital and 12 engineers in a 14th century barn in Cambridge. You can see a picture of it there. And its new CEO, now Sir Robin Saxby, convinced the group to aim to become the global standard for risk chips with a target of embedding ARM designs into 100 million chips by the year 2000, 10 years later. So that seems to be a pretty aggressive goal for someone with 12 engineers and not much money. Um, so one of the things that they realized is they couldn't do it all themselves. So they would need to build a, a group of partners around this to make it work. And the breakthrough came when they took their design proposal for the chip with Texas Instruments, who were the fabricators of the chip. And they took it to Nokia, which was then the leader in mobile phones. And Nokia told them, this is inadequate. This, this never do the job. It, it uses up too much power the phone will get too hot and burn people and uh, you need to do something much better than this and instead of going away and just trying to make a new design uh, what arm realized is that this group nokia who were not even their customers because arm was selling to people like texas, texas instruments who make uh, chips they're actually the customer's customer of ARM. Two steps removed in the chain, they needed to become a key partner. And so having recognized that, they actually put a person inside the customer's customer, like Nokia or Samsung, 100% of their time to understand what their needs were and where their technologies were going. Um, 
And they came up with a kind of a picture like this. A whole lot of partners, so the OEMs are people like Samsung, today Apple, there are a whole series of other partners. And, and what you see interestingly about this is that some of them interact directly with ARM, but some of them mainly interact with each other. So they're more like the industrial district or the medieval common. They're not all controlled by ARM. There's, they've built a, a, a set of looser relationships, this kind of ecosystem where the partners are doing their own thing, but they're coordinating their investments and they're coordinating their innovations and so forth. Well, this has been very successful because it provides an ability for ARM to provide a lot of benefits to the end users. I won't go through them all, but you can see them coming up on the screen there. And ARM also gets some benefits from each of the partners, and those benefits are largely about knowledge. So the knowledge of the future roadmap of people like Samsung, the knowledge of the future roadmap of people like uh, Texas Instruments or Taiwan Semiconductor. And the partners also get benefits out of this. They uh, get the chance to have more potential customers by using ARM's design or to uh, have wide availability of training for their engineers. So it's a mutual benefit system where uh, everybody is doing it for their own purposes and their own benefits, but by coming together in this ecosystem, they are uh, actually able to create more value for the end user and also advantages both for ARM as the lead firm and the, each of the partners. And today, that's, they've created a huge ecosystem. That's just some of the companies that work with ARM in this ecosystem and also work with each other. Um, and they, of course, they're used in all sorts of things now beyond mobile phones, including cars and biometric fingerprint sensors and uh, tablets and so forth. Uh, today, there are 150 billion chips have an ARM IP in, in them. And uh, it was acquired by SoftBank for 32 billion US dollars. And just recently, NVIDIA's tried to buy it. It's not clear whether that will be approved uh, for 40 billion. Now, they're not paying 40 billion for a relatively small number of people. ARM only has about 3,000 employees. Uh, they're paying for this huge ecosystem of partners that ARM has built and its ability to be flexible and to innovate. So uh, we found that these strategies are particularly useful when you need to achieve three things. To realize an uncertain vision, so you can clearly see the potential, but you don't know how to unlock that potential. And, and a, a, a good example of that today would be moving from making cars to mobility solutions. It's, it's very clear that mobility solutions are not going to be innovated and delivered by just one company. You're going to need a whole ecosystem of partners uh, to make that happen, in, including regulators and, and providers of infrastructure and so on, uh, where you have to unleash learning by bringing together diverse capabilities and knowledge, and where you need organic flexibility so that the ecosystem can, can uh, continually reconfigure itself. Now, we uh, therefore have argued in the book that managers need to think about how they uh, can move their companies away from a corporate hierarchy or a pure market to look more like these ecosystems. And a lot of times they 
they think, well, I'm going to make a, a two-sided market like uh, the Apple App Store. And, uh, or they always want to put themselves in the middle, controlling everything as a hub and spoke. And, and of course, what we've found is that those sort of structures uh, don't produce innovation and they don't produce flexibility because the lead company becomes a bottleneck or in the case of a two-sided market, there's very little information and knowledge exchange between the parties. So what you need is a structure where not only you interact with the partners, but the partners interact between themselves. And interestingly, when we studied Amazon Web Services, we found, as you see in this picture, all the innovation happened between the partners around the platform, around Amazon's web uh, cloud service. Uh, people who were creating new technologies, new software, new types of infrastructure, new types of training, and so forth. So, again, the, this is an idea that goes beyond. But when we tell uh, managers about that, they say, okay, but I can't control my ecosystem. And we say, no, but you can catalyze, shape, and lead your ecosystem. And uh, the, the way I try to explain that to them is that back in the 1950s, if I told uh, one of these managers that they could have a strategy for the market, they would have told me, well, you can't control the market. Um, there's a price, there's a quantity, there's supply and demand. What do you mean you could have a strategy for the market? Well, now, of course, nobody thinks that's a strange idea. We all think about how can we shape the market, how can we position ourselves within the market and so on. And I think the same thing is true of today, that forward-thinking companies are gaining success by shaping the formation of their business ecosystem around their company uh, to make their company more successful, but also their partners more successful and the whole system of commons to be more innovative. So uh, the books about how you actually do that, uh, you can see on this chart, I won't go through it all, um, that you need to get the thing started because no one wants to join your ecosystem when it's small and weak. They all want to join it when it's big and successful, but somehow you need to kick start it into action and uh, grow it. And you need to uh, improve its productivity and find ways to lead it. And of course, uh, one of the ways you might do that is to think about how can I get other people to invest alongside me? So the analogy would be, what's your match to light a fire of investment, not only by your company, by lots of other people. As an economist, I would say that's the way you get from constant returns to increasing returns. Good example of that is uh, Amazon's Echo. Uh, they actually uh, sell that at uh, a, a, a loss. Um, and the reason that they do that is to get lots of the things out there which they control. But of course, they also give the services of Alexa Voice away for free to people that are making software. And by 2020, their partners have invested 100,000 and creating 100,000 skills that can deliver value to the users. So that's an example of this philosophy of how do you get other people to invest in things that will not only make their business more successful, but also make your business more successful. Of course, you have to monetize that, and I, I don't want to say too much about this, but uh, the way you do that is to make sure, firstly, that the ecosystem delivers more value than any end user uh, uh, come, uh, it's to the end user that any company can uh, do themselves. 
And you even need to also identify some kind of keystone that is the, the activity you control that the ecosystem needs. Otherwise, there's no way for you to make money out of it. And you, of course, you've got to set up the right toll gates to collect the, the tolls. So um, there are important ways to think, how do I actually monetize this ecosystem? But it does have the advantages of innovation and flexibility. So I'd like to end off just by saying, why do managers find it so difficult to think about how they could lead such an ecosystem, something more like the medieval colonies or the industrial districts in the way that it, it brings in different people and diverse capabilities and skills. And the reason they find it so difficult is because most of their training has brought them up in a world of command and control. And to lead an ecosystem, they need to lead beyond the boundaries of their organization. In other words, how do they get people who don't work for them to do things? Uh, they also need to accept less control and predictability and think more about nudging partners to do things. They have to work harder to align different activities and capabilities. They have to manage the shared learning and the risk of IP leakage in the ecosystem. And they have to work harder on where to extract profit and they have to accept more of it is, is shared. They also need to restructure their own companies to work within the ecosystem so that they can focus on what they do best and let partners do the rest. And that's very difficult for most companies who always think I can do it better than the partners. So they're, they're, they're quite low to let the partners really develop. But of course, the ecosystem won't get anywhere unless they do that. Um, they need to build an organization that can interface effectively with these external partners. And the people in the organization, the employees, need to be comfortable with the idea that the partners are both cooperating and competing with them at the same time. So it turns out that although there are many case examples of where developing these ecosystems have huge advantages, and uh, those advantages are very real, they're very difficult for traditional managers to achieve. So, uh, if you want to know more about this, let me take the opportunity, sorry, Julian, just to promote the book on one slide. Uh, the, the book explains what I've said today and also tells managers how they should go about actually leading an ecosystem beyond uh, what they control. So thanks very much for your attention. Um, sorry, I've gone a little bit longer than I hoped. I'm afraid that professors always do that. So um, my apologies, but I hope you found some things of interest uh, in, in what I, I have mentioned. Well, thank you very much, Peter. That, that was really fascinating and a wonderful way of, of rethinking a lot of what I at least had, had thought about how businesses might operate. Um, I do love the example of ARM. Um, it, it's one of my... Uh, favorite things I remember a few years ago when, when they achieved what to me was a very important target, which is that they managed to sell more ARM chips in a year than there are human arms in the world. <laughs> yes. uh, and, 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 and to me, that, that, that works well. Although I have to say from experience, that joke doesn't translate very well into other languages. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, Julian, that most people realize, of course, that They've only done that with that huge uh, group of other people helping them. So, <laughs> and, it will, I, and I think that is remarkable because, of course, you know, they haven't got those billion dollar fab plants. They don't make the chips themselves. Right. <laughs> the very small margin piece, there are other people who do, but they take a huge margin on designing them. Um, and I think it's also a lovely story. And I remember Herman Hauser, one of the uh, founder there, saying that it worked because they had to make things simple. They didn't yeah. have enough money um, to make a very complicated thing, as you touched on. And so they had to design something simple. It turned out that's very low power as well. 
So um, now I, I have a number of areas where I would take th this conversation, but now is the, really the opportunity for you, the audience, to ask questions that you want to feed in. So um, please do go to the Q&A tab and ask, I wouldn't say anything you like, almost anything you like, as <laughs> it is on bounds. Um, but you know, there's a real opportunity here to, to learn more from Peter about his work on this, but also on many, many uh, other issues. But now, while I'm waiting for questions to come in, Peter, is this true in all areas? You know, if somebody was setting up a business or leading a business now, when should they be saying ecosystems are the way to go? And are there areas where that's really just not, not needed at the moment? Yes. So I, business school professors always love to say we've found the silver bullet. But I have to tell you, we do say that ecosystems are not for every industry and every business everywhere. Um, what they're good at, as I said, is, is dealing with bringing knowledge and capabilities together in a sort of a fuzzy vision where you're not quite sure who has to do what and what the outcome is going to look like. So again, I mentioned uh, mobility as a good example of that. Everyone can see there's value in replacing cars with a different mobility system, but it's not very clear what that looks like. And you're going to need enormous amount of learning and innovation and interaction to make that happen. So in those cases, uh, ecosystems are very good. If you've got a very stable technology, a very stable product where everybody knows their role in the value chain, uh, then the ecosystems are not efficient because it's a lot more efficient to coordinate that either through a corporate hierarchy or market. There's a lot of wastage in the ecosystem, but, but the benefit you get from that waste is more innovation and more flexibility. So um, it's, it's very useful in industries which are changing quickly and where no one company, as I mentioned, has all the capabilities required to, to solve the problem. I think that's really helpful. We, we, we do have a, a, a number of questions here. So, um, and I start off with, with, oh gosh, they're really flooding in now, uh, with the first one that came in for, for Robert Stanford. Are there parallels or similarities with Creative Commons and open source solutions? Is open source a bit like an ecosystem? Yes, and, and uh, that's, that's a very good example. It's not just the open source itself, but what you've typically found is that there is some kind of lead firm, even in this open source world, when they really take off, but they're not trying to do command and control. They're trying to make the group of open source more efficient to uh, standardize some of the interfaces to allow people to interact uh, well together. And then, of course, what you've also found is that some companies have built businesses like Red Hat, for example, uh, uh, around that ecosystem by adding things to it. So um, that's a very good example. So I, I, it's not just open source in a narrowly defined way, but it's open source and everything that's around it, including leadership by certain firms within the open source community and people adding things to, to or, or developing further based on the open source interaction. I think it's fascinating. Um, one of my other favorite Cambridge companies is, is, is something called Real VNC. I don't know if you've worked on them at all, but they were an example where there was, a, still is an open product VNC, uh, which you are very welcome to play with, or they will wrap things around it in a, in a similar way. Uh, I think they're particularly fascinating because to the best of my knowledge, at least, they're the only company that made its initial seed money from merchandising. So they had That's merchandising for real VNC and that gave them enough money to buy desks, computers and everything else to grow. So, um, so there's a number of other things going on. So David Good says, have you studied cases where people have tried to create an ecosystem like this, but failed? You know, you can often learn a lot from failures, but, but you know, he says, are, are such cases just undiscoverable? <laughs> no, we're, there, there are quite a few uh, uh, ecosystems that failed, and we do actually talk about them in the book. Let, let me give you two 
well, one is actually Nokia. So Nokia tried to create an ecosystem around the Symbian uh, uh, mobile phone operating system. Uh, and it basically tried to control this so, uh, all the partners in it so, so much that the partners actually gave up and left. <laughs> and they were left without their ecosystem fell to pieces. And interestingly, Google was able to build the Android ecosystem. And one of the reasons why they didn't try to control that to the same degree is that Google doesn't know anything about operating systems. So they had to rely on the partners and let them, let them go. Um, a, a, another, another there was originally 43 different companies involved in, in developing Android. So, and, and then of course it, it grew from there. The, the other interesting cases of, of, of a failure is actually a failure to make money out of the ecosystem. And that is a good example of that is the IBM PC compatible ecosystem. They built a huge ecosystem and actually set the standards for personal computers. But they didn't make any money out of it because they, they actually were the orchestrator of the ecosystem, but they didn't control any key component. And the people that controlled the two key components were of course, Intel and Microsoft, and they made all the money. So the ecosystem worked, but the ecosystem leader didn't work. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, so, I mean, your, your example of that, that failure there is fascinating. It sounds like, you know, the, the lessons learned for ARM are don't have too much money to start with. The lessons learned with, with uh, Android is don't know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> yeah, especially for system. Um, no, you're quite, it's, sorry, that's quite right, Julian. We found the biggest reasons for failure is because the ecosystem leader thinks they can do too much and therefore doesn't rely on the right group of partners and tries to over control the ecosystem, yeah. So, so, so there is merit to ignorance, or at least being aware of your level. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that slightly brings me to a question from David Stoughton, um, who asks, how easy is it to overcome trust issues, not just between partners, but also for end customers? You know, when I buy a product and I know it's come from a particular company, I, I know who I'm relying on, the more nebulous it is, how do I know what's going on? Yeah, so very, a very, very good point. So uh, what we found is the ecosystem leader has to take responsibility to make sure the partner does fix problems for the end user. So they can't say, oh, it's our partner's problem. <laughs> so, you know, you, and, and that's a good example of the thinking that's required to make these things work. The lead firm has to think about the health of the ecosystem as a whole. And having disenchanted users is not good for the health of the ecosystem. So they have to make sure they take responsibility for getting things fixed or getting partners to uh, to to fix the uh, the issues and uh, there's a couple of questions about sort of getting some of these things going so andrew nye says many thanks really interesting if your organization needs to operate in other people's ecosystems does it still make sense to start your own ah oh, right now that's also a very good question uh the what what we actually have a little sort of choice uh, diagram in the book about this, but that basically, if you, if you have one of the key components and you need to rely on a lot of other people, but you're very important to them, then you can become the ecosystem leader. If not, you should concentrate on being a partner in someone else's uh, ecosystem. So there, there's a kind of a choice there of when it makes sense, but you, you definitely have to have this keystone uh, role if you're going to become the leader of the ecosystem. It's not just because you decide to be the leader. You, you have to ha have one of the key components uh, around this, you know, so that, that's important. I, I, I should also, um, I should have said something about the trust, which is very, very important. And, um, you know, 
that that requires lots of behaviors of the ecosystem leader to build that trust. One of them is not to tread on the toes of their partners too much. Another is not to try to squeeze the lemon dry. So they, they actually, ARM interestingly calculates how much money it can take out of this ecosystem before it will actually cause the health of the ecosystem to decline. So, and um, the, the other thing is, uh, building trust by, by making it very clear that you're not going to um, distribute proprietary knowledge from one partner to another. So there's lots of decisions that have to be made about where you share what you learn from the ecosystem with others and when you don't share it. <laughs> so, uh, and that's going to be very important that you're, you're not sharing proprietary or confidential things to building trust. Uh, that's an interesting thing about how much you can take out of the system. It feels almost like conversations about agricultural ecosystems. Yes, you know, no, that's what right. Yeah. Sustainable lead. Yeah, so that, that, that's why I go back to the analogy of the commons. You've got this environment here, and, and if you just uh, rape and pillage it, <laughs> uh, you know, you're, it's going to become un, unproductive. And the same is true of these ecosystems that you've always got to be thinking about what do I need to do to promote the health and sustainability of the business ecosystem and what do I need to do to take a certain amount of profit out of it for myself and how do I balance those things. Now Zhang Liu who obviously you and I both know that she work, work, works with both of us um, points out that you're, you've talked about big companies so what are the implications of ecosystems for smaller companies um, you know, the question is, is it that the ecosystem makes ARM ARM or is it ARM, Amazon, Alibaba that make their ecosystem successful? Can small firms construct and lead an ecosystem? Yes. So I, we have a number of examples in the book and ARM is one of them where a small company, 14 engineers in Cambridge, by the way, Cambridge has a very distinctive feature in this business and that is it's a place where there are no customers. So, um, and that's important because uh, we have found that interestingly, small companies can often have more opportunities to lead the ecosystem because they don't try to over control it. And it's obvious to them that they need to uh, work with partners. So as you said, because ARM had a few million dollars and you need a billion dollars to build a wafer fabrication plant, it was pretty obvious to them that they needed to partner with somebody else to, to make this happen. But it's not just them contracting them to do it because you can't, a little company like that can't contract uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, which has, you know, 40 billion US dollars of sales or more. Um, you, you, they're, so therefore, they had to find a way to partner with them in, in the system. So uh, we think it's good for small companies. And, and one of the failures of small companies and startups is actually they try to do too much themselves. And the ecosystem thinking is a way to think, I should just focus on what I can do and can do best, and I'm going to get other people to do things around the ecosystem. So, so it sounds like we're heading quite close to Schumacher and small is beautiful. Yes, indeed. <laughs> which is, which is Large awesome. companies are their own worst enemies because they try to do too much themselves and try to control everything. <laughs> so, so, so that, that takes us on to some of the very biggest organizations. There's a question from Christopher Jolly, uh, who says this is a really brilliant presentation, but would any of this apply to government? You're talking about businesses, but governments are also incredibly hierarchical and in need of these ideas. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I think we've seen lots of examples during COVID where this is very clear, where the government tried to do things themselves like test and trace. Actually, they should have relied a lot more on partners, both within local government and the private sector to actually build an ecosystem to do this. So um, I, I think, you know, one of the great 
difficulties governments have, and I think it's very unfortunately true of our government here, is, is a failure to implement well, <laughs> whatever the policies are. And it's not just what they've tried to do is just contract out the implementation, where I think actually they need to think much more about who are the partners in both the private and maybe the charitable sector and maybe other, other levels of government that can be part of this ecosystem to make it happen where I'm not trying to be the command and control, but I'm trying to be the catalyst in, in actually getting this to happen. Mm. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see which countries have taken which approaches where that correlates with success. But, um, and, and I should just say, we have a, another event uh, for the Intellectual Forum tomorrow night, in fact, with Jadeep Prabhu, a, a colleague of Peter's at the Business School, talking about how should a government be, which is very specifically about digital innovation. Uh, in government. So you, you're all very welcome to turn up to that uh, if you haven't already done so. But while we're on the theme of government, there's a, another question from David Good um, about advice. What advice would you give to local and national government agencies who want to stimulate the creation of ecosystems in a locality? Is there something which local or national governments can do or is it a, a policy fantasy? No, I, I, I think they are. there are things they can do. Um, but as we explain, you, you, to start out, you have to find someone to work with you who doesn't have an answer to the problem. Otherwise, they're a supplier <laughs> and that's willing to co-invest with you to find the answer uh, and be, be willing to think they are going to get a benefit out of this and there's nothing wrong with that happening <laughs> if that actually makes the thing come together. So, so choosing the right uh, people, finding the right people. And in fact, one of the interesting things we found is that the successful people took a long time to find the foundation partners, sometimes almost a year or more who had the right combination of capabilities and incentives and the right mindset to say, this is a discovery process we're entering into. It's not a subcontracting process. So I think, you know, if governments approach it the right way, they can make this work, but it's, um, and, and I should say that we're not asking all these partners to do it out of altruism. Uh, they can, you know, make a profit or achieve other objectives they want to achieve uh, by being part of it. Uh, but there, there has to be a shared uh, common interest and uh, one has to share the benefits. So we've had a couple of questions about uh, more general issues about Ostrom and, and, and Commons. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so the first is, is from Buddha Steiner. Uh, it says, fascinating insights. Thank you. You mentioned Eleanor Ostrom in the Commons and highlighted networks as ecosystems without mentioning values or norms, social capital, um, as they, if they remember correctly, and I, th I think they're right. Was there a specific reason for that? Or do you not think that values, norms are crucial to forming a sort of mutually trustworthy network? Um, well, I, I think, I think uh, common values in the sense that people all have to gain something out of this and this very important value that the health of the ecosystem as a whole is important. So I, I, they, they were kind of buried in what I said, I suppose I didn't bring them out um, uh, so much, but uh, we also know that there are problems of free riders in these ecosystems or, or people that try to take out more than they, their share, you know. And therefore, we, we also found the ecosystem leaders needed to have a sort of policing role to, uh, to eject people, essentially, uh, who didn't follow the values and didn't have the health of the ecosystem uh, in, in their mind. So uh, we have found a number of examples of that where, where that had to happen, where they were basically 
you know, cut out of the system because they didn't have the right approach to, to the, the health of contributing to the health of the ecosystem and sharing things. Um, uh, one of the other important values there we found is that the ecosystem leader has to be willing to invest in sharing its knowledge or money or something with the other partners to get it going. And it's no good them saying, oh, we just want you to be a partner, <laughs> you know. So th this, this value, so the key values are this idea that health is very important, that it is a matter of innovating by bringing together knowledge that hasn't been brought together before. And we're all going to get a benefit out of that. And, and maybe we need to worry about how it's carved out later <laughs> when, when we come into it, that we're trying to make a vision happen. Now, the other question about medieval commons and uh, 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 Dostrum really relates to sort of more biological ecosystems. Are, are there lessons from, from, from any of these ideas that are useful for those who want to organise around mitigating climate change, biodiversity loss or other large scale commons depletion issues? This is a question from Ellen Quigley, who, of course, we know from Jesus as well. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I'd say two things on that. So. One of the things we're very aware of is the danger of taking an analogy too far. So you know, a business ecosystem isn't like a, a, a natural ecosystem or environmental ecosystem in, in, in all uh, respects. But I think there are some lessons about uh, thinking if I want to do some things in areas like dealing with climate change, the idea that I do need to bring together diverse capabilities, and I don't really know how they're going to fit together. So I need a sort of flexibility and a degree of self-organization. But I also need to think what is the value proposition for the partners, not only for the the outcome that I want, so protecting something or dealing with some problem. And because I think a lot of, a lot of these issues, if, if the partners are only doing it because they see it as sort of charity, this is not going to be as powerful if they actually see, you know, I can make a future business out of this, which is going to be good for me and also, good for the, the environmental challenge or whatever we are. So looking for ways to do that. And, and I, I suppose that pretty much like a, um, a natural ecosystem in the sense that uh, the individual organisms have to thrive within the system and they, they have to take some benefits out of the system as well as contribute to them. So. Uh, I think I think there are some lessons we can probably learn and and certainly some interesting lessons, I think, if you want to try to lead or catalyze an ecosystem to deal with some of these problems, what kind of things you have to do and what are the hurdles to doing that? Yes. So there's, there's another question from David Stoughton who, who says, sounds like you're talking about ecosystems as being independent of each other. And, and surely even in the existing system that there are overlapping ecosystems and subsystems within others. You could be a member of more than one ecosystem, more than one subsystem and leverage the interface to create value. Is that true or are they more separate? No, that, that is true. So we're, uh, we, we kind of, uh, like, like any people trained in economics, we, we, <laughs> we try to assume away some of the complexities. So. But one of the things we're now looking into is actually the competition and cooperation between ecosystems. So uh, I have uh, described this as an ecosystem, but there are multiple ecosystems and their overlaps and so forth. Um, but thinking about what, what a leader can do is uh, easier if you sort of define the problem slightly narrowly, even though you know that there's uh, it interfaces with, with other ecosystems out there. So uh, 
we, we don't dismiss that, but um, <clears throat> it's just a way of reducing the complexity a little bit. But there are lots of interesting issues about how ecosystems cooperate and compete in, in, uh, if we see more of these uh, kind of organization structures, yes. Um, we've only got time for one or two more questions. So if you have anything burning that you'd like me to sort of <laughs> in, now is now is the time. It's not so much for you, Peter. Um, uh, but so that one question from Jai Quante, uh, it picks up on this idea that you said about how much you can take out. So right. when it comes to investing in ecosystems, how do companies define a fair value of investment? Is there a fair investment earning ratio that people might think about? Well, um, one one way to do that is and we've proposed this in the book, is that just the same as you have measures of return on investment inside your company, you have to have measures of health of the ecosystem and uh, how much ecosystem health you're, you're getting out of the investments that you and other people are making. So there's some fairly simple ways to look at that. For example, um, the turnover of partners into and out of your ecosystem. As I mentioned with Nokia, if everybody's leaving, this is probably means you haven't got the investment versus uh, profit equation right. Um, uh, how much innovation there is in the ecosystem, how much flexibility there is. So there's a certain set of things you could look at as to whether you've got this a balance between investing in the health of the ecosystem and investing in things which are going to make you profitable, have you got that balance right? So um, again, this is one of the things that for most managers, it's quite difficult to do because we've had, you know, lots of measures of return on our own investment, but we need to have measures of return on what we invest in the ecosystem and what other people invest in the ecosystem. So uh, as, a, as a commons. Hmm. Um, another question is uh, about, um, uh, well, I'll, actually, I'll do, I'll, there's two here, I'll do, I'll do one and then the other. Um, one is about um, how much this applies in different places around the world. Are there some parts of the world, some countries, that are more advanced in thinking about ecosystems and others that are more traditional? Is it different in the US, from Africa, from Europe, from Russia, China? Uh, how, does, how does that picture vary around the world? Yeah, so, so there, there are some differences. Let, let me just mention two. Um, small countries out of the way of like New Zealand, tend to be very good at ecosystems because, again, they don't delude themselves that they have everything they need locally and everything they need in their country. So <laughs> that's the first thing I would say. So, you know, whether that's Estonia or New Zealand or, you know, generally small people from smaller countries find it easier to, to adopt this thinking. And, and in some ways, the worst off are the middle-sized countries because they're not big enough to have everything they need, um, yet they're big enough to think they have everything they need. So you know, that's a problem. Um, so, so, and, and then there's also a cultural element that generally in Asia, I'm not that familiar with Africa, but uh, you know, the idea of alliances is perhaps more um, deeply uh, part of the business culture than it is in, in say, the US. So uh, they're, they're the two main differences, whether you think you're big enough to have everything and don't need other people and, and uh, uh, you know, the sort of business culture, whether it's used to uh, this idea, because there are also some compromises that are happening inside these ecosystems about who's doing what and the, how much money you're taking out of it and what you're investing and so on. Um, and, and there's just a funny observation from Bodo Steiner that in uh, the government in Finland, uh, where they've created a behavioral nudge unit with interactions with businesses. So it seems like Finland may be a good example. I'll get in trouble if I start accusing Finland of being small and out of the way. <laughs> uh, years of history, but um, you know that, that may be a nice example. 
No, I well, uh, uh, it is a nice example, and and I think you know uh, th this this whole idea of nudging is is part of the bigger idea, which more and more companies in this world are having to do, which is how do I motivate and and nudge people that don't work for me because I not everyone I need is going to be inside my organization, whether I'm a government or a, a business or whatever they are. Um, I, I, I actually worked very uh, closely with Nokia in the early days. And one of their huge advantages were they were from Finland and therefore it was obvious to them that they didn't have all the technology and market knowledge and knowledge of consumer behavior they would need to become the global leader. And so they followed this kind of learn from the world strategy, which is what I worked with them on. The problem is when they became dominant in the industry, they convinced themselves that they didn't need an ecosystem. <laughs> so, so actually, um, as I said, one of the big advantages you have for leading an ecosystem is to be born in the wrong place. Fascinating. And I think it's perfectly true that if you want to start, start the global leadership in mobile phones, when Nokia did, you wouldn't have started in Finland. <laughs> you would have chosen somewhere else. <laughs> but so it turned out to be enormously valuable because they again went around the world looking for knowledge, that could make them successful. And they didn't have a kind of not invented ear uh, syndrome. Fascinating. Now, I, I mean, I'm tempted to explore whether universities themselves are good examples of business ecosystems with the very, <laughs> very loose relationship and that a, a historic building such as the one that you and I are, and I are standing uh, in, in First Court, you know, was about bringing lots of individual people together to form that ecosystem and that's why universities have been successful and maybe yes. to be i'm successful. sure the college is an ecosystem and i you know a lot of a lot of uh, research projects are ecosystems which involve other academics they might involve companies that are creating technology you would need to use and research or you know they might be people that have data or other things so i, I think actually academics are, are quite uh, well versed in how to uh, do these things in, in a way that most corporate managers are not because they have been brought up in a command and control uh, hierarchical system or a belief that market can solve whatever problem you need but as i said markets are, are absolutely hopeless at trading knowledge unless it can be written down on a piece of ip so uh you know and and that's probably why universities have looked more like these ecosystems so that's been a really fascinating talk Peter, and, and thank you very very much I and mean, that's all that we really have have time for but you covered so much there about ecosystems you know, from the, from the technologies to, to the history, looking at business, government, academia just then, bit of environmental work. So thank you so much. It's been really good. And uh, Ecosystem Edge is a fantastic book. And I, I do recommend people, but it's not just you who's recommending it. <laughs> <laughs> and we've certainly been pushing it out on Twitter. So we'll see if there's a, a bump in sales where there's an ecosystem of people doing add-ons. Um, Very good. And, and thank you all, all very much for joining us. Um, uh, tomorrow, as I mentioned briefly, we have a talk about How Should a Government Be by Jaideep Prabhu, talking about uh, digital innovation and government. And uh, so, so do come along to that. Next week, we're talking about museums, museums of the future, um, with, with um, uh, 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 some wonderful uh, speaker, Gus Casey Hayford, um, who's now setting up the new V&A Museum uh, here in London. And then we'll be talking a bit later than that about some of the digs and some of the nuns around Jesus College, if you've been impressed by the history uh, that we have. So I, I do hope to see you at many more of those. Peter, thank you so much for a really inspiring, fascinating, thought-provoking talk. Thank you, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs>